Good morning, Murdoch Baptist Church, and those that are joining us from wherever. Uh, we're so glad you're here with us on Resurrection Morning, uh, the focal point of everything about the Christian faith. And, uh, and we're so glad that you're able to join us. I hope that it's been a great morning for you. I hope you've listened to some music. I hope you enjoyed the two songs those young ladies sang for us just a few minutes ago. If you missed them because you're just now getting on, I encourage you after service and after our discussion at the end, I encourage you to go back and start this feed all over so you can join in listening to Christine and Celia sing those two songs for you because I know they'll bless your heart. It's been an interesting morning here for us uh, as we, uh, as some of you got some text messages messages early on, that uh, there was an opportunity for those that are not able to connect via the internet to be able to uh, listen in on a cell phone or a landline. Now, the reason that came out so late is simply because uh, we just got the approval. Been working on it for weeks, and we got the approval just within the last hour or so. And so we got that out as quickly as we could so that some could join us. And so if you're able to do that this morning and you've not been able to join us, welcome to worship this morning, especially on this morning where we celebrate our Savior's, our Savior's resurrection. It's also been an interesting morning in the fact that as we sat here and we're getting ready, it sort of started getting warm in the house. And I noticed that the air conditioner had stopped working. So uh, we reset it, waited a few minutes, came back on, and now it's cool in the house again. And so we're very thankful. I am so glad that you're here. I am so glad that we're able to celebrate. Uh, there are lots of places across the country where people, are, uh, where people are, are, are so up in arms because they can't get to their church today. But listen, we are the church where you are as we join together. Even though it's online, we're gathering in the Spirit of God to worship together the risen Savior. And so I want to share with you this video. And so I, I encourage you just to sit back and watch this because, listen, as much as everything around us is in turmoil and in chaos, there is something that never changes. <laughs> I hope that inspires you and encourages you and reminds you there is nothing that happens that shakes God. There is nothing that moves him from his throne. There's nothing, no matter how much we're upset, God is still the same. He is and always will be the same. So I invite you to stand. Uh, Pastor Michael has put together this song for us. I invite you to stand and sing with all your hearts as we worship. Don't sit and watch. Today is not a day for watching. Today is a day for worshiping. So stand and sing together with all your heart with Pastor Michael.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid in the death of Christ I live There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. For I am His, and He is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand Did you enjoy that? Were you able to worship? Well, I invite you now. Let's pray. Let's pray specifically uh, for churches all over, uh, all over the globe that are celebrating this morning the resurrection. Let's pray and praise to our Savior who was raised. Let's pray for all the things that are going on around us. Let's pray that God eradicates this virus. And let's pray for, uh, for the things that take place within our churches. 
uh, the resources that are needed for churches to continue to function. So if you will, will you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we thank you. And Lord, with all the differences that are taking place in our lives, with the ways that we relate to one another from a distance, Father, I pray that you'd help us to continue to plow into each other, God, that you'd help us continue, Lord, to be relational. For, Lord, you created us for relationship. And, Father, for many there are that, Lord, because they have been so separated, Father, they feel so disconnected. And they, 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 they aren't able to see those that they love. They aren't able to be with those that they love. And, Lord, in many churches around, uh, around the globe today, Father, they're not able to even do what we're doing today uh, online. And so, Father, they are very disconnected. For those, Lord, that are doing worship online, or, Lord, for, for those that are having drive-in churches, I pray that today will be a worship of who you are. For, Father, you are worthy of all of our worship. Lord, you created everything. God, you made a plan. Lord, the only plan, Lord, to, to bring back and to remove the separation from man because of the sin that's in us. God, you loved us enough that even while we were yet sinners, Christ, you died for us. And so, Father, we lift your name on high. We thank you for how your power was displayed in the resurrection. We thank you for how your power is displayed in our lives and in our midst. And, Father, we lift you up. And, Father, we simply ask, Lord, there are loved ones that we know, people that now we are becoming aware of, Father, that have been impacted directly by the virus in their bodies. There are others that have been impacted because of the virus in their jobs. Lord, others that have been impacted because of distances and the separation that has taken place because of the virus. Lord, there are so many impacts. And yet, Lord, for each one of us, Lord, it, it's a little bit different. And yet, Lord, we need your peace. And we need your comfort. We need your healing. We need your help. And so, God, we simply ask, God, will you intervene right now in our country, in our globe, and will you eradicate this virus? Father, will you remove it from our presence? And Father, will you help remind us, Lord, that this virus that we cannot see, which could infect us and take our lives, is not as great as the virus of sin that infects all of us. And Lord, that if it's not dealt with through the blood of Jesus, Lord, that we will die. And not only will we die and be put in a grave, but we'll die and be separated from you and all others eternally. God, will you just give, you've given us just a small glimpse of what it's like to be separated relationally from other people. And so God, help us not, not to miss this lesson. Lord, that sin separates and separates with a finality that's far beyond COVID-19. And so, God, we ask you to eradicate it. Lord, I ask you to eradicate, Lord, uh, Lord, the sin in my own life. Help me to live in such a way, God, that I, that I don't want anything to do with those, those things that pull me away. But, Father, help me only pull into those things that draw me close to you. And Father, we do ask, Lord, for your people to be, to be continuing, uh, continuing to be faithful. Lord, as we, as we bring tithes and, and offerings into the storehouse, God, that we continue uh, to provide the means, Lord, that you can do the ministry through the church that you desire to do, that you've called us to do. Help us to be faithful in that. And Father, we'd ask you now that you would teach us this morning, that you'd guide us this morning. Lord, that you'd open our hearts this morning in such a way that we would see you in all your power and, God, what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I mentioned about, about tithes and offerings. I just want to remind you that uh, there's three ways that you can continue to uh, be faithful in your giving to the church. You can put it in the mail to 18 375 Cochrane Boulevard. Uh, Port Charlotte, Florida, 33948. And I know someone's putting that in the, in the chat there, so you can grab that if you don't already have that. Or you can go onto our website, not this Facebook page, but to our website, and you can go up into the right-hand corner where it says online giving, and you can set up an account there if you don't already, and you can go through that online portal. There is a third means of which to give, uh, to continue to be faithful in your giving. If you want that third means, call me. Call me and I'll tell you what it is. You can call me at, uh, at 
8185, and I'd be happy to tell you how to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Murdoch Baptist Church, for the way that you have been being faithful. And I thank you for the way that you'll continue to be faithful as we move into these next few weeks. Uh, I don't know how long this will last, uh, but we'll, we, our promise to you is we will continue to be right here uh, ministering to you, right here faithful and, and available for you. And so uh, we thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning. So this morning, as we look at the resurrection, as we look at all that it means, I have to look back to what the Passover meant. And see, the Passover, there was a question asked at the Passover. Every single time it was asked, one of the first questions asked was, what makes this, diff- this night different than all other nights? You see, because that question was asked so that, so that the elder there at the table could begin to tell the story of the Exodus. They could tell, how, they could tell the story of how God had his people in Egypt and how he brought them out through miraculous signs. The last being when the death angel passed over Egypt and that they had celebrated this meal. They had celebrated the killing of a lamb and they'd taken the blood and they put it on doorposts and on the lintel above the door. In any house that had that blood on it, the death angel passed over it. Any that didn't, the firstborn in those houses died, even Pharaoh's. And so they begin to tell that story and they begin to tell all the things that God did and and how God brought them through that. And then they celebrate God's provision, but they also look forward to his ultimate redemption. So the question then comes to me, what's so different about this morning? What makes this morning so different than any other morning? Well, for the disciples... After, a, after the gloom and doom of the previous days, as they had watched the betrayal, the arrest, the trial, the suffering, and then the death of their Savior, came the Sabbath. A day on which they did not work, on a day in which they weren't able to do, to do anything because they were supposed to be focusing and resting on who God is. And so therefore, all they had to do, all they had was to allow their minds to run over and over the events of the last week, the events of the last years. There was no way for them to get busy and occupy their grief. And as they woke up that Sunday morning, that first, day of, that first day of the week, they're overwhelmed with ideas and thoughts of how, how, about how the last three years have just, as a vapor, have faded away. How the promise and the hope that comes with the Messiah, who they thought Jesus was, it's been squashed by the religious leaders and the Romans. All that's left now are for some ladies to go to the tomb and finish the, the, prepare, the preparation of the body of the one they loved, the one they had followed, for them to go and, and take care of that last remaining detail. This one that they had followed, this one who had done such miraculous things for others, and yet he could not or would not avoid this final deadly confrontation. You see, little did they understand all these events. Even though Jesus had told them over and over and over that he was going to be betrayed and he was going to die and he was going to be crucified. In fact, in Matthew chapter 26, it says, verses 1 and 2, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, You know, if you've been listening to me, you know, that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. He had told him the same thing about that one that was going to betray him. And then later in chapter 26, he tells them again that he's going to die. Maybe today, maybe this morning, you find yourself not understanding the promises and the assurances the Lord has given to you as a follower, as someone who has trusted Christ. Or maybe this morning you've turned in and you've simply got questions about Christ. We would love to help you with those. We'd love to be able to help walk with you and pray with you about those. 
And so right now, someone's going to post on there some numbers for our elders. They have phones that are logged to these numbers. And so if you call them, someone will be there to answer and to talk with you, maybe about some of the questions you have about Christ, or maybe some, maybe some of the questions you have about the promises and assurances that he has. See, the disciples had questions all the time. And if you read the Gospels, the disciples are asking questions all the time, but especially on this dark weekend. I mean, the question for them is, why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to die? You see, for them, their perspective is the fact that they thought the Messiah was going to come and was going to kick out the Romans and set up the kingdom right there. And Israel was going to come to the top of the heap and that they were going to rule and reign with him. And they were going to set up God's kingdom right there in Jerusalem, right there at that moment. And yet, that's not Jesus' perspective. That's not Jesus' purpose. And Jesus' purpose is he came to suffer and die for us. He came because of what Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, every single one of us has done something wrong. I just want you to think in your mind, is there anything that you've ever done that God said not to do? Is there anything that you've ever done that, that you've not done that God said to do? And the answer pretty quickly is yes. Yes, you've told a lie, you've had a thought, you've disrespected your parents, you've, you've been belligerent, maybe you've used God's name in vain, maybe you've done whole lots of other things. But I want you to know we're all in the same boat. All have sinned. And so Je from Jesus' purpose, he came because we had all sinned and that we couldn't do anything about it. You see, because the wages of sin is death. It's like punching a clock. When you punch that clock, you get paid based upon the hourly wage of how, how long you've worked. The problem is when, when sin is our wage, it just takes one sin and we earn death. And death is separation from God. Death also is going to lead to the grave because our bodies fall apart. But death is separation from God eternally. That's what the wages of doing anything that God said not to do and not doing what God said to do. It's death. that separation and eventually the grave. But see, there's a but right there in that verse. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ His Son. Why did Jesus have to die? So that He could provide this gift for you and me. That, so He could make it possible that death did not have to be in our future, that this separation from God could end right now, and that even though there is a grave in our future, there's something that happens after that grave. So the disciples didn't understand that at that point. They weren't getting it because they had this other viewpoint. But listen, after the resurrection, when they preached, the thing they emphasized was not the cross. Yes, they said that, they, that Jesus had died, but the emphasis in their preaching was always about the resurrection. It was always about what Jesus had done by overcoming death. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, For I... For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This is one of the earliest documented places where we see the Gospel is being taught very clearly. And, and this is one of the most powerful teachings. It's one of the things that Paul was taught as an early believer. It's one of the things they continue to teach over and over and over. This is the basis. This is the bedrock of Christianity. This is the bedrock of faith that leads to salvation. So the question then is, why did Jesus have to raise from the dead? Why, was there, why did he have to raise from the grave? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, he says, listen, if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. <laughs> it's an empty hole in the ground. And you are still in your sins. You see, the resurrection proved that Jesus had power over sin. Sin he carried into the grave, but sin could not keep him in the grave. 
Then, if you all, then also those of you who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, this is, if in this life we only have hope in Christ, then we are of all men the most pitiable. If all we believe in what Jesus did while he walked the face of the earth, and Jesus did lots of good things, and there's lots of people that talk about how great a teacher he was and how, to, how he was a moral guy and how he taught about all these things. If we just talk about the good things that Jesus did while he was alive, but we do not recognize that his death and then his subsequent rec- resurrection, if, that, if all we believe is the first part, but not this resurrection, then we're pitiable. Listen, we, are, we, we, we don't have anything different than anybody else that died. You see, here's the thing. The only one able to forgive a sin is the one who has been sinned against. If I do something against you, you're the person that has to forgive me. I don't go talk to Tom or, or to Joe or to Sally and ask them to forgive me for what I did to you. I need to ask you to forgive me for what I did to you. And see, the thing is, all of our sin, even though it's acted acted upon against other people many times, all of our sin is first and foremost against God. And so God is the one that needs to forgive us. So Jesus came and died and rose again that you might be forgiven. This is what it says in in 1 Corinthians (coughs) Chapter 15, verses 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Christ came to forgive so that death has no more power. This is what it says in verses 56 and 57. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's where we have power. There's where we have the power of the resurrection in us if we are in Christ. He says this in John, in, in John chapter 11. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he will live. That living isn't just after we die when we go to heaven. It's living right now. It's experiencing life for us. It, it, it's for us living with purpose and power, living for the glory of God, living in the way that God created us to. That's the reason Jesus rose from the dead. Over in Romans chapter 1, it says this. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised, which God promised, before through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son jesus christ our lord who was born of the seed of david according to the flesh and declared to be the son of god with power according to the whole spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead what proves that jesus is is the Son of God? His resurrection. What is it that proves He is God in the flesh? His resurrection. What is it that proves He has the ability and the right and the power to forgive your sin and my sin? The resurrection. Why did Jesus have to be raised? So that He could have power to forgive you and me. You see, in the Bible, there's a couple words that we sort of stumble over and we look at them, and especially at around resurrection time, we look at these words and we're sort of like, okay, I'm not really sure what they mean. They're not words that I normally use in my everyday language. And they're the words propitiation and expiation. You'll find those in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, Romans 3, 21 through 26, and Hebrews 2:17. First John 2, 2 says that Jesus came to be the propitiation for all the world. Well, what in the world does that mean? You see, expiation is this. Let's go there first. Expiation is God taking 
off of or taking out of by what Christ did for us, by dying for us, he takes off of us the penalty that was on us. Christ's death paid the debt for us, taking away the penalty that was on you and me. Propitiation is what God does for us. God puts on us. God gives to us the righteousness of Christ that makes it, makes it possible for us to be declared the children of God. You see, that's the reason Jesus had to raise from the dead. Because if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then he's no different than you or I. He's just a man who lived a life, did the very best he could, and now he's in a grave. But because Jesus rose, he's shown the power of God in his life as God in the flesh. And he's able to take the penalty off of you and off of me. And he's able to then place upon us the righteousness in which he has lived. You see, also, Jesus' resurrection gives us the ability to lay down our arms and no longer be at war, to no longer rebel against God. As long as we are living in our sin, we are still shaking our fist at God. We're carrying arms against God. We're at war with God. We're not at peace with God. But the resurrection of Christ makes it possible that we can be reconciled to God. God doesn't have to move. God's not done anything wrong. It's us being able to move towards God. It's not that he's run and hid someplace. It's we, like Adam and Eve, that have run and hid. It's we that have continued to do the things that are wrong. It's we that have been at war with him. And so he simply says, listen, all these things are true in the resurrection. This morning was different for all of these reasons. So as Mary and the women come to the tomb early that morning, it wasn't the fact that the tomb was empty. It wasn't the fact that someone had stole a body in their minds. It was the fact. He is risen. There's something different, fundamentally different, never happened again, never will happen again in the course of human history. The Son of God died for us and rose again that all those things might happen in us. And as Jesus appears to Mary that early that morning, the disciples, where are they? They're still locked behind doors. They're still hiding. They're still away. Even after Peter and John come and see the empty tomb, they go back to that place, into that locked room, and hide. This is what it says in the book of John. John chapter 20. Then the same day at evening, same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for they feared the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be with you. What happens when Jesus raises from the dead and is in your midst? And you trust him? And you're behind locked doors? Isn't that where many of us find ourselves today? We're locked behind closed doors. We don't let anybody come in the front door lest we let a virus in. And he says, listen, if you'll let Jesus change your life, if you'll let Jesus into your midst, if you'll trust him, he can say to you this morning, peace be still. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they had saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Believers, if we have Jesus in our midst and we have peace, we have been given a commission, Lord, to, to share that peace with others. Even though your door may be locked, even though the only avenue you have is through, is through technology or through the mail, he says he has sent you and I to deliver peace to those that are captive. That's what he's called us to do. You see, the, these men that Jesus comes and stands in the midst of, just like us, we're behind our doors. We think we're safe and secure. These men had just a few days before been eating and enjoying the Passover with the Savior. These are the men who heard Jesus say, this is my body broken for you. 
And this cup is the new, te- new covenant in my blood. I didn't understand all that because he had changed the wording. He changed what was said there with the third cup, the cup of redemption. He says that and, and they don't understand it, but they just, they just go along because Jesus says a lot of things they don't always understand. What they didn't understand is this. Jesus is telling them, I am about to become the fulfillment of this cup. I am about to be the sacrifice. I am about to be the lamb that is slain. And this cup of redemption that was emptied for you and me, that is full of the wrath of God, it is fully extinguished. It's fully excised on the cross in the death of Christ. I, I, at a church that I was at when the Passion of the Christ came out, and there was a man, his name is Wayne. And you know, we went and saw the movie, and I had I, had, I had previewed it beforehand and then took a group of adults, I took a group of teenagers, but with the caveat that they all had to come back to church afterwards so we could debrief it. Because there were some things in that movie that I knew would cause a lot of questions. And as we're standing in the kitchen and, uh, and fixing some of the, some of the uh, refreshments afterwards, Wayne looks at me and he says, Ron, he says, do you think it could have been that bad? I said, oh, Wayne, it was far worse. And with a shocked expression on his face, he said, how could you say that? And I said, it was far worse because I know how bad my sin is. I knew all of what Christ had to pay for on my behalf. And when Christ was was bearing all those things, he was doing it on behalf of all of mankind, all at one time, not just me. And I know how bad I am. You see, over in Isaiah chapter 53, he says this, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was beaten for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, all of us are those sheep. We've all gone astray. All of us were once in the darkness of a womb, waiting to be born. And when we were born, the only thing we brought with us, besides joy to our parents, was a sinful nature. Throughout our lives, we've acted upon that sinful desire. We've lived for ourselves the way we want. We've lived separated from God, knowing that there's a longing in our heart, a void in our lives, that no matter what we try, we cannot satisfy that longing. There's a greater darkness awaiting us, the darkness of the grave, because of that sin. And sin only steals, kills, and destroys. That's what sin does in every life. There's pleasure for a moment, but it steals, it kills, and destroys. And it eventually ends this life, and it leaves us in an eternal darkness forever separated from God and from everybody else. And the worst part of all this is there's not a thing you or I can do about it. There's not a thing we can do to alter this. It doesn't matter how much good we do. It doesn't matter how much investment we make in the lives of others. It doesn't even, ma- it doesn't even matter if we die for somebody else. Our sin is a part of who we are and we stand in judgment. The good news of the resurrection is this. So into this darkness steps the light of the world. The creator, the one who said, let there be light. And he takes on flesh and he walks among men. And that a sin that affects all other men, it doesn't have anything to do with him for he's the son of God. And he is never, never acting out the way we do as sin tempts him. Everything he does is exactly how God says to live. And this light cannot be extinguished even though men hang him on a cross. 
and not even when he's put into a cold, dark tomb. Because on Easter morning, on resurrection morning, he burst forth in resurrection power, fully showing his power to love and to forgive you and me, no matter where you are or what you've done. The death of Christ would have been ordinary, been just like any of us, if it weren't for the resurrection. But because he is risen, we do not have to enter the darkness of a grave with sin. Instead, we can face the end of life. We can face all of life with the hope of that light and that life. Not entering sin, not entering the grave with sin, but instead with a Savior who not only loves us, but promises us to raise us. This day is different because the power of God is fully revealed in the resurrection. That not even, the pow- not even death has power over the Son of God. Romans 8, 1 tells us, says, Now therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And because we are in Christ Jesus, not even death or the grave have power over us, for He has broken them. The resurrection changes everything. And it can change you. It can. Christ has changed me from someone who used to trust all the good that I did, all the stuff that I knew about the Bible, all the ways that people thought I was a good guy. I came to the point that I recognized that that wasn't enough and that I needed Jesus. And He's changed me. He's changed me into a man that trusts, that follows, and seeks the approval of God rather than impressing or the approval of others. Here are a few others that want to share with you how God has changed them.
So, as you watch that, was it like that? Was it like, like for you like it is for me? It <laughs> just brings tears to my eyes. You see, because I know all those people. I've watched all those people. And, and, and listen, when I watch some of them, I just, I, as I watch it, I simply say, oh, but he is one of the most sharing men that I know. He's one of the most loving men that I know. And they would all tell you, it's not me. It's Jesus in me. He has changed me. So let me ask you this morning, are you living your life right now in the darkness of sin? Are you living apart from God? Or has your life been changed? Are you living in the light and the life of the Savior? Your life can be changed just like these that have been changed. You see, for them, this day is so special. They get so excited about this day because they recognize this day that we celebrate. This resurrection day is what enabled them to come to Christ and be forgiven and be changed forever. To not be like they used to be, but to be something that is far different, far more pleasant, far more godly. And so listen, this morning, what about you? Do you need Jesus? Do you sense a pull in your life? Do you sense this tug in your life that God is reaching out and drawing you towards Him, saying, oh, please trust me. Let me change you. I want to tell you, those elders are still at those phone numbers. I mean, if you'll call them, they'll talk with you. Or if you just want to listen to me for a minute, I just want you to know, you, you've got to come to the place that you admit that this life of sin is not, not what's good for you. It's not what's best for you. It's keeping you separated from God, and if truth be known, it's separating you from other people too. It's causing you to be unfulfilled, unsatisfied, maybe depression and despair. Maybe some of the things that are in your life that you see Sin doing its work, stealing, killing, and destroying you. And you have to recognize the point that Jesus is the only answer. That you're just trying to clean up, you're just trying to be different, you're just trying to be nice, you're just trying to pile up good, good, good merits and good points here and there, isn't working. And so you turn by faith, everything in your life, you turn to Christ and you simply say, I want to trust you with all that I understand about you, with all that I am, with all of my sin. I want to ask you, will you forgive me? I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to trust you and you alone. I will follow you with my life. And the Bible says the grace of God will forgive you and make you right and make you a child of God. Romans tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To call upon His name means that you want to make Him your Lord and your Savior. Will you do that this morning? Will you change how you've been living life instead of for you living for Christ? Because if you will, He'll change you in some remarkable ways. Just like He's changed these that you've seen in that video. Now, I just want to speak to those that are believers for just a minute. I want to challenge you. Listen, you've seen what these others have shared. You've seen how easy that was just to take a few pieces of paper and write down those things. And I want to challenge you as a believer. There is no reason, listen, there is no reason why you can't do the exact same if Jesus has changed you. And so here's what I want you to do. The only reason you wouldn't be able to do it is if you don't have a device that has a camera. If that's the case, let us know. Maybe we can have somebody swing by and, 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 and do it for you, video you from a distance. But if you have a device, there is no reason why you can't today, before, before you have lunch, take those papers and write on there what you were before Christ. And now that Jesus has come into your life, how He has changed you. How the risen Savior has saved you and what He's done 
to change you and what you're excited to declare to anybody and everybody that will hear. What is it that Jesus told those disciples when he came into that locked room? He said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Listen, I want to encourage us to take that video. I want you to do two things. I want you to post it on this page right here. I want you to post it to our page. I want you to, I want you to get it to us, okay? The way you do that is you post it on your site first and then share it with Murdoch Baptist Church. Share it with us, okay? We love to see those stories on our page as well as on your page. Get the word out there that you are a follower of Christ and he has changed you. Because he has saved us and changed us by doing all that the Father ordained for him to do. And because we've responded to him in faith, we come to that point where we recognize that we understand, like the disciples did, that at Passover, what exactly he meant. This is my body broken for you, given for you. And this is the cup of my blood in the New Testament. We recognize that those are fulfillments. We recognize that those are symbols. Those are ways we celebrate in remembrance what this day means and what every day after also means. We recognize what Christ has done for us. So I'm going to encourage you, if you're a believer in Christ, to get your cup, if you picked it up from church, or get those elements that you set aside, that cracker and, and, some, and, some, and some liquid, Remember, it's not, there's, there's nothing magical about this. It's the celebration of what Christ did for us. And so if you need to go and run, grab that cracker and grab that, and grab that liquid, go and do that really quickly while I read this passage to you. Just turn your volume up. He says this in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus came and lived a sinless life. He lived a righteous life to show exactly what life was supposed to be like. And if you're like me right now, you're having a hard time getting that bread out. There it goes. That bread that represented his body was the flesh that the Son of God took on. It was sinless. And he offered it willingly for you and for me so that by his stripes we might be healed. Take and eat. It says, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. If you watched our Good Friday service, you remember this cup. You remember it, it was, it, this represented the cup that Jesus asked if God would let it pass from him, containing all the wrath of God, containing all the sin of us. I just want to show you this morning. It's empty. It's empty because Jesus shed his blood. Jesus made the promise. Jesus fulfilled the promise. Jesus paid the debt. Jesus redeemed the sin. Jesus saved us by his blood. He did that. Take and drink. Now it says that they sang a song and they went out. But here's what we're going to do, okay? One is if you're a preschool parent or you're a preschooler watching, there is something special over on Murdoch Baptist preschool page. It's about five, six minutes long or whatever. I want you to go over there and watch it. 
Go over there and check that out. And then I want you to come back to this. We're going to stay live right here. We're not going anyplace. We're going to have a time where we're going to have be able to share and discuss and ask questions and, and just get some information out that, that, that we want you to have. So we're going to, we're going to stay live right here, but preschoolers, you and your parents go over to that other page, the Murdoch Baptist preschool page and see that video and then come back here. Here's what I want you to do when you come back. I want you to tell me what you saw and what you thought. Okay. And listen, preschoolers, maybe you can't type, but if you tell your mom and dad what it is you'd like them to send to me, I bet you could do that. For the rest of us, for all of the rest of us that aren't going to the preschool page, I want you to join in just watching and worshiping. Okay. I said that watch. I don't want you to watch. I want you to worship in the midst of this song. I want you to, I want you to sing along with, I want you to raise your voices. I want you to praise the Lord as we worship in this song. And then we'll be right back here in just a few minutes to be able to have a live discussion. Okay. I'm going to stay live, answer questions. You can share with us. If you need, if you need anything, you let us know. I got some questions to ask you. I got some information to share with you. We'll see you in a little bit, but let's pray before we go. Okay. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, not just because we got to be together, not just because it was technology. God, we thank you because Jesus rose from the dead. We thank you for what all this morning means. We thank you for what your scriptures tell us. Father, that you want to set us free from the bondages of sin, just like you did in Exodus. When you brought the children of Egypt, the children of Israel out of Egypt, you brought them out of bondage. God, you want to do the same thing here. It's, it's a fulfillment of that, of that picture of the Passover, that the lamb comes and sacrifices himself to set us free from bondage. Help us to leave Egypt. Help us not to, help us not to, to look for and to pine for the things of Egypt. Help us look for the promised land, the, the life that's in Christ all that you have in store for us. And Father, we will praise your name for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you here in just a few minutes. If you're an adult and you're staying with us, watch this video and worship, worship the risen King. Let's sing that great hymn of the faith. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I Love 
so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. God's people said, Amen, Pastor. Let's... So welcome back. We're glad you're here, and uh, I'm going to sit here for as long as as long as you, as long as you're willing to talk and share. And uh, I got some things, like I said, to share with you. And if you've got some questions, what I like most of all right now is just to ask you in the comments if you would write, if you would just type in there, what is the thing that the resurrection means most to you? What is it that brings you the most joy, the most hope, the most peace? when you think of the resurrection? What is it that gets you most excited about the resurrection? You go ahead and type those things. So as you finish typing that, what are some of the songs? I'm just curious. What are some of the songs when you think of Easter morning, resurrection morning? What are some of the songs that really, really just excite you? I hope you saw posted on our page. Uh, there, was a, there, was a, there was a link there to some YouTube play, uh, playlists where maybe if you haven't been there yet, maybe you want to go there today, an opportunity for you to click on those. Uh, we've got four different ones there that you can, that will give you just a list of a variety of songs that you can, it's got lyrics on them and then the words, I mean, the, the music's behind that. Uh, you're able to, to worship right along with those. And so I invite you, if you haven't been there, to go check that, go check out that posting there on the Facebook page. And, uh, but I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the songs that when you, um, when you think about this morning, what, what was the song that you woke up this morning that you just had to listen to before worship? Or what's the song that you have to listen to before the day's out? What are those songs that come up in your mind? Okay? Okay. 